for this morning, we actually are going to be talking about origins of life. And you'll note the title of the session is New Approaches to Origins, and I think that all three of our speakers this morning really epitomize very innovative and cutting-edge approaches, so it should be a really exciting session. Um, we're going to have Baju Patu Kajar speaking first, um, and then Irina Mamajamov and Leroy Cronin. So to set the stage for um, sort of to get you in the right mindset for thinking about origins kind of from new perspectives, um, I'm going to just do a sort of brief introduction this morning, and then I'm going to pass it off to Batu um, to get us kicked off. So uh, new approaches to origins, um, one of the things that uh, you might um, you know, think about with the origin of life is what are the relevant questions, and it's been a really exciting time to work in origin of life field because there have been a lot of really new ideas. Um, just in the last few years generated through a lot of centers that have formed um, recently, which probably a lot of you uh, know about, like the Center for Chemical Evolution at Georgia Tech, LC in Japan, there's a Harvard Origins Initiative, um, and it's bringing a lot of new perspectives into the field. So um, with this idea of, of new approaches, um, there's been a kind of emphasis on reconceptualizing the origins of life, and we even had a meeting at Carnegie Institution about a year and a half ago now with that, that name. Um, and so, the idea is not just to focus on the chemical pathways to origins, but also the networks and information properties, and really bring in some deep insights from the knowledge we've gained about evolutionary biology and synthetic approaches to understanding living systems. So those are the kind of things that we're going to be hearing about today. And the idea is really to try to drive out a universal understanding of living systems and to use origins as a platform for doing that. So for any of you guys in this room that have worked on origins of life, I think one of the things that's really compelling about that problem is it forces you to think about biology in totally different ways. And we're really seeing that inform um, not only our understanding of origins, but our understanding of living systems more broadly. And so I hope that you all get a lot out of this session as far as thinking about biology differently in addition to thinking about the origins problem. And so when we were um, coming up with who to include in this session, um, some people in this room probably were involved in the strategy guide that came out of LC um, almost two years ago now. But I think this nicely captures kind of the, the merger of all of these different approaches to origins that we're seeing now. So traditionally in the field, we may have had more of a historical approach, but there's increasing interest in synthetic and universal approaches. And so the original idea for the session was, why don't we get a speaker from each one of these different areas? And so that's kind of cool to try to see the merger and the origins of life. But what I really like about all three of our speakers that we have is they are all squarely in the middle already. So this is going to be really fun. Um, and with that, I'm going to now have Batu come up um, and talk to us about synthetic biology and <laughs> Earth's past. And you are all set. Am I? Yeah. Oh, is it? OK, great. Perfect. Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks um, for joining us this morning for a discussion on origins of life. And I am an evolutionary biologist, and today I want to talk to you about what biology can do in order to answer the questions in origins of life, and also what biology has been doing uh, in, as a part of the astrobiology field. This is the last slide that I have. Can we go to the beginning? And with that, thank you very much. Um, yeah, all right. <laughs> that was a great talk, yeah. Thanks for all the great questions. <laughs> all right, next. I was uh, harder, all right. Um, I did uh, obtain this slide from John Barrows. Uh, that beautifully, I think, summarizes the approaches that we have in order to answer questions related to origins of life. And biology, in particular, falls into the category of the top-down approach, that we can use the organisms today or sequences of genetic information that is available to us today and extrapolate information about the past biological states. And of course, for origin of life, you can imagine life has already, for, for a biology to study origins of life, it's a bit of an interesting problem because we do deal with life itself. So life should originate for us to study it. But as biologists, we also have a room and place for questions about astrobiology and origins of life, and I'm going to be reviewing what those are. 
And, and one of the main uh, approach that uh, it has been commonly used today <clears throat> is developed by environmental microbiologists and geobiologists, and that builds on using modern microbes today that are obtained by a variety of extreme or not extreme environments, and then using these microbes as a proxy to understand the ancient environments or early environments uh, that, that, that could possibly give rise to evolution and emergence, perhaps, of life itself also. And my observation is, though, is that recently there has been other development. There have been other developments that aim to target biological organisms at the molecular scale, and then modify these organisms at the cell or molecular at the genetic level, and then try to extrapolate not only extrapolate information, but to see if we can reconstruct biology that would give us information about the origins of life. And that's, an, that's a challenging question, because in one hand, we do have genetic information that we have today, but the genetics today is a result of about at least 3.5 billion years of evolutionary accumulation. So in one hand, we have the genetics that we have today. On the other hand, this genetic information has been overwritten, and that is, the, on the other hand, the only fossil that you can think of for a biologist to extrapolate information about the past itself. So how do we then use the genetics that we have today in order to understand the ancient genetic conditions? Especially knowing that all life we know builds on this, this central mechanism that drives from the DNA and the, and the RNA and the protein information. So what you have today, all life today uses this basic system to, to replicate but, and generate variation in response to the environment. And the early life also built on this very core system. So in this case, this could help us, right? So we have genetics today, and we have the core genetics today, and then we think that this also was the same in the ancient life. So how do we then use today's genetics and then infer the ancient genetics? And well, lucky for us, there have been a lot of senior people also in this room that thought hard about this question, and then that developed techniques also that thrived by research that was funded by NASA. But additionally so, in the biology field today, there have been techniques and methods that are developed that are outside of our field, but also could potentially benefit origins of life and astrobiology uh, biology research. And during the next few slides, I'm going to review a, a multiple techniques that I think as, as origins of life and astrobiology researchers we could use, and we've been using some of these things increasingly so. And, and it, 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 Top level, when you look at this, you can see that these are not the questions that origins of life and astrobiology community is interested. These are questions that are interesting to perhaps DARPA, to NIH, to, for example, at the outbreak response. And how come a technique that is developed for a rapid outbreak response can be used for an ast in astrobiology and origins of life research? But well, if you think about it, at the core, all these tools that are developed for a rapid response to a human or environmental need do rely on connecting genetics and environments. If you were to understand an outbreak response, you need to understand at the genetic level or at the cellular level or at the community level what the response is in a changing environment. And of course, for an outbreak response, the environment is not going to be in hot, acidic environment like we think ancient environment was, but the environment will be perhaps a, contamination, a contaminated water that the human population is exposed to. But it doesn't matter. The tools are still developed to connect the cell and the genetics to the environment, and we can benefit from these tools in origins of life and astrobiology research. And NASA has been working differently than all these great foundations that support our research. NASA has been encouraging us to develop to not only develop tools that will have an immediate answer to these questions, but extract and benefit from these tools and combine them in a very interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary way and apply it to the questions that involve deep fundamental um, questions about life. So how do we apply these techniques to uh, the questions of astrobiology and origins of life significance? I will walk you through a multiple of uh, these techniques and, and how do we use them today in, in uh, astrobiology research and what I think also can be done moving forward. 
So at the DNA level, we are at the, perhaps at the, uh, the revolution maybe has already passed, that we all benefit from the whole genome sequencing, the, the ability to identify all the changes of a biological organism's genetic component. And this organism can be as simple as bacteria or more complicated than a bacteria. And here you're looking at the data that was published uh, in 2010 by Rich Lansky's group that revealed the whole genome and the mutation that has accumulated on this genome throughout the evolution of this E. coli bacteria in the laboratory. And this was quite revolutionary. We can map the mutations in a genome and understand what these mutations perhaps can even do in, in, in terms of impacting the behavior of this organism in which these mutations are accumulated in. And, 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 and I do benefit uh, from this uh, methodology in, in my lab. And I'm, I'm not the only one in the astrobiology community. NASA has been investing a lot of resources and time in order to use these tools that are significant for us. And they're actually, as an astro, there is an astrobiology note right now that is only targeted on evolving organisms and studying the behavior of these organisms using a variety of genomic techniques. And in, in my research, I do start with an initial population, an initial bacteria, and subject this population to evolution in the lab under a controlled environment that may or may not replicate an ancient Earth environment. And then I study the changes on this population by subjecting this population to whole genome sequencing and mapping the changes in the DNA of this population through a periodically at any given time that I desire. Next innovative, the, the, the hot tool that we have is, is CRISPR. CRISPR can be imagined as a molecular scissor. It is, it is now being thought as one of the most, uh, I would say, useful tools that we have in biology that, of course, we could engineer genomic content, DNA of an organism in different ways before by relying on uh, the perhaps recombinators, for example, that are given to us by the, that we extract from viruses, for example, by stealing from nature, we could modify a genome. But the premise of CRISPR is that now we are able to, perhaps we will be able to modify any organism that we want at the precise genomic location in a very rapid, in a very rapid way. And, and given that the premise is that we can use this system in any organism, Hollywood wasn't, you know, didn't miss this opportunity. And if you watch the last uh, X-Files and the last, uh, the last, at the end of the X-Files, a new one is coming, uh, at, at the end of this X-Files, Scully was saved because her genome, and not only Scully, but the whole human race was saved because the genome content of humans were engineered with alien DNA using CRISPR-Cas system. <laughs> so that was great. And, uh, and, and we do rely on this CRISPR system uh, in, 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 in my group right now in order to engineer cyanobacteria with, the, with synthetic and artificial genes in order to reboot the behavior of cyanobacteria to perhaps see if we can reconstruct a bacteria, a cyanobacteria that behaved like it did in the past, given that we think that the innovation of uh, evolutionary innovation of cyanobacteria itself has contributed to the, uh, the, the, even the oxygen that we have in the atmosphere today. And, and, and what we do is that we grow cyanobacteria that we obtain from a variety of environments, and then after culturing this bacteria, we engineer the, the cyanobacterial genome, which was also needing information to be that cyanobacteria has three genomes. This is a new system for me. And we can use, by using CRISPR, we can target the specific regions in the cyanobacterial genome and sync with the cyanobacterial um, circadian cycle in, our, in a way that uh, our gene will be active whenever we want in terms of the, in sync with the cyanobacterial growth itself. And uh, paleogenetics, and the pioneer of this field is, is I think, with us here today, Steve Benner. And he, uh, he in, in 1990, showed that by reconstructing and, and inferring an, an ancestral sequence that builds on generating a phylogenetic tree, we can uh, extract information about the past by just looking at uh, the behavior of a protein. 
And uh, of course, the paleogenetics itself is shown here, builds on generating sequences. And by looking at a sequence itself, we cannot really understand what the protein uh, output uh, can do, what the function can be by, by only looking at the sequence. And this very point remains to be one of the biggest challenges in biology today. Can we extract information about the behavior, about the function, by looking at the way these letters, DNA or amino acid letters, are written? And, but yeah, paleogenetics has been uh, increasingly so used also recently, and even a paper came out, I believe, like last week, on ancient kinases and how these can be used also to benchmark ancestral environments. But also what was not shown is that we do generate all these ancient proteins and make inferences about the ancient Earth, but can we see that if, whether these proteins would function inside a cell environment? And that's, uh, that's what I've done uh, previously with the support of NASA postdoctoral program, where I uh, engineered a modern microbe with an ancient uh, inferred ancestral sequence of a ribosomal protein. And, and today, we are engineering cyanobacteria with the ancient versions of the Rubisco protein. And Rubisco itself is, first of all, thought to be the most abundant protein that we have today. And, and one significance about Rubisco for, the, for, the, for geologists and geobiologists in the room is that it, it is thought to be, its function is thought to be significantly coupled to a significant biosignature, which in this case is, is the carbon isotope. So if the function of this protein is directly coupled to a biosignature that we use to infer the ancient environments, by reconstructing an ancient protein, can we then recapitulate or resurrect an ancient biosignature in the lab solely by building on biological components? And in order to answer this question as a first step, we've reconstructed the phylogenetic tree of ancient Rubisco. And, and there have been several attempts to create trees about Rubisco in the literature. But for our uh, tree, we used all the Rubisco sequences that are available to us today. And that included the ancestor of cyanobacteria. For example, here you have the group uh, A to C and D, the whole group B. And we have the ancestor of cyanobacteria. And going backwards, all the way back into to the ancestral Rubisco, that's supposedly the ancestor of all currently existing Rubisco proteins. And then we inferred the structure of these ancient proteins and tried to understand where the changes, if any, throughout time are located on the protein itself. And are these changes important for the protein's function or not? And currently, we are engineering the cyanobacteria with these very ancient Rubisco proteins with, with the goal of measuring this, but the biosignature that's going to be generated by this engineered organism. And I think this can be used for a variety of different isotopes by using a variety of different organisms. Now that we have so much information about the biosignatures and we know so much about the microbes itself, thanks to the work of environmental microbiologists and geobiologists. Last but not least, I want, to have a, I want to say a few words about the artificial organisms. When, when we think of it, uh, the, the, the original cell itself also, in a way, very foreign to us. We don't know by original, I mean the oldest cell. And in, in these two uh, relatively recent examples, well, one of them definitely is recent. I think came out in March 10, uh, last month. And on the, on the right, you're looking at the smallest yet bacterial cell that contains only 473 genes. So for non-biologists, this may still seem like a large number, but it is, it is for us the, the smallest genome that we know um, so far, and, and it is created artificially in the lab. And, and for just to, I'm, uh, I'm studying about the, the House of Representatives these days, and I realized the House also has about 400 something members. So I was thinking, okay, if all the members of the House worked in the, the precise way, and if they did their function the best way possible, we could also create a functional organism <laughs> and, and today. <laughs> And on, on, the, on, the, on the left is the synthetic uh, yeast uh, that is also engineered to create artificial uh, genome. And this also will be interesting to the, to the members of astrobiology community that study uh, yeast organisms in the laboratory and also uh, answer questions related to, uh, to, to the origins of multicellularity. 
And I think what could be interesting um, and be maybe decades away from this is, is to engineer the last universal common ancestor or an organism that is similar to that, uh, that has no prior, perhaps, genetic baggage, that we don't deal with the accumulation of genetic information and restricted by what the, the rest of the cellular machinery will, uh, how the, the rest of the cellular machinery will respond to our ancient or any synthetic gene, but, but build a system without any prior genetic baggage that, and that we can control better than, than what we do with a modern uh, organism. That definitely has more than uh, more the higher amount of genetic information and also history. So with that, uh, th these are a bit, uh, this is what uh, I would like to do in, in, in my lab. Uh, hopefully, I have a long and good career. And uh, this, this is what uh, that I would like to achieve by combining synthetic biology and bacterial evolution, by, by extracting information from molecular evolution and experimental evolution, and, and studying the, the evolved organisms in the lab at the molecular and cellular level, and by engineering the, the systems and networks by learning from nature, and then tying the behavior that we reconstruct in the lab to the, the environmental level, to the information that we get from the rock record. And, and with that, I would like to thank all the funding agencies that are supporting us, and, and NSF, and recently uh, NASA once again supported us through the as an outcome of the Ideas Lab and Origins of Life. And, uh, and my student, Anna, she has a poster on the Rubisco reconstruction and modeling on Wednesday, and I will talk about experimental evolution and biosignatures work through two uh, technical talks on Thursday, if you'd like to listen more about it. And uh, last, I would like to plug in a book that will, that's going to come out. Uh, uh, we, we are working on this book as a biologist and, and a geologist, a paleobiologist and an anthropologist to talk about the life's uh, automata and how we can link biochemistry and fundamental information about the, the life's working to the, the geochemistry. Thank you very much. Well. time for about two questions and we're also going to have an open question session for all of our speakers at the end so um, two questions if we have people come up to the mics they're in the aisles that was such a fascinating talk come on guys nobody's awake this morning oh thank you uh, are we I all have right. to be louder I know you guys need more coffee <laughs> okay uh. Hello, uh, Stuart Bartlett from uh, ELSI here. Uh, thanks for the great talk. It was fascinating. Do you have any um, uh, possible suggestions for how we might take a top-down approach that goes, um, goes even further back before the genetic era? So is there any way that we might be able to deconstruct um, an ancient organism back to a kind of pre-genome stage? Is that might be possible? Um, so I think that what I didn't talk about today were the tools that are developed uh, as an outcome of the astrobiology and origins of life research. And one of this is, um, uh, like the protocells, I would say, is, 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 is one. And I think uh, the closest I can think of would be to start with a, uh, a, a liposome and, and then see whether we can um, create an evolvable system within this um, cell-like uh, component. I had a, a little question for the Rubisco system because it, you know you have all those proteins, and you study the mechanism. Can you see from the mutations uh, traces of Earth evolution, or is there well, what information do you get out exactly, or or what what are interesting aspects on those experiments? Yeah, th thank you for this question. So uh, we do see. So what we did when we when we looked at the structure of the, the ancestral proteins is that we tried to understand whether there, uh, whether there are mutations at the part of the protein that impact its function that we know today, which is its interaction with carbon dioxide and oxygen. And then we want to understand whether we see any changes in, in, in these regions as we go backwards in time. And what we found is that particularly for the uh, ancestral node that corresponds to what we think is the ancestor of cyanobacteria and the ancestor preceding that uh, are the two ancestors that we see differences in, in a high level of mutation. 
And so it's kind of interesting. It's almost like protein doesn't ex sub experience much change and then a lot of differences in, in, in the region that is important for protein's function and then stability again. So we think that those perhaps could represent uh, the, the viscose that may uh, coincide with the great oxidation event. Thanks. So let's thank the two again for an excellent talk. And we're going to welcome Irina Mamajimov um, from LC, and she is going to be talking about messy chemistry. I got it, yeah. <laughs> Okay, good morning. I got it, so I see a clicker now. <laughs> I need that. Uh, well, good morning, and thank you all for coming, and thanks for the invitation and kind introduction. So, I've just been sent a couple of times. I'm from Elsie, and I have to say it once again we're a wonderful international, quite unique institute. There's a lot of us here at this conference, and actually, in the other building, we have our booth. We provide a lot of opportunities uh, for scientists at different stages of their career, so please stop by in the other uh, building, pick up some information, talk to some of LC people. And if you're off-site, I would like to encourage you to read this wonderful article Mark Kaufman wrote about us last week in Astrobiology magazine. So I'm going to be talking about uh, this new or like a concentrated approach, and it's very much a concentrated uh, effort for many people from ELSI that are working on it. So when you're thinking about origin of life, there are a few chemical approaches you can take. One, and this is how we chemists are trained, is to take classical synthetic chemistry approach, take a single reaction, try to maximize yield of the product. However, when you're thinking about Prebiotically plausible system, you're probably not thinking about those clean reactions. You're thinking about HCN polymers. Those are heterogeneous um, polymers of incredible complexity, products of many different chemical processes. You might be thinking about Miller Urey system, in which produces a vast uh, system of monomers and polymers that are relevant to, probably to biologically relevant. And if you're thinking a little bit more exotically, you might be thinking about solids of Titan, another very complex mixture of polymer. And this is a picture of um, Titan as seen by Cassini Huygens. And the polymers are supposedly in that brownish color. And yet again, when you're thinking even about a uh, biological pathway, this is how would a biochemist define life. And when you're thinking about lifelike process, you're hardly thinking about one single reaction. You're probably thinking about some subset of this uh, vast system. And so it doesn't it stand to reason that you know, just to study systems that are converted into more orchestrated, more clean biological system rather than single reaction diversifying into this uh, biological system. Well, I'm sorry, Stephen, I know you're somewhere here. So Steve Benner likes to say that when organic molecules are given energy and left uh, uh, to their own devices, they devolve into complex mixture more suitable for paving roads than sustaining Darwinian <laughs> evolution. With all due respect, we would like to disagree. So we <laughs> Uh, at LC, well, so we're starting this research project, and we're in the habit of calling it messy chemistry. And of course, we're borrowing a lot of concept from system chemistry and complex um, system science. But I just we needed this new term because, for example, systems chemistry is often referred to small and defined reaction networks as coming from synthesis world when um, researchers are using bio-inspired methods for uh, new synthetic approaches. So in our mind, messy chemistry is where prebiotic chemistry meets systems chemistry. It's a, a system of complex interacting multi-component reaction network, uh, not necessarily unstructured, but structure of it is not immediately apparent. And in our minds, origin of life is transition from messy chemistry to well-defined, well-controlled biochemical networks. So the way we're doing it at ELSI, we're trying to study this messy chemistry as one entity. We're not trying to deconstruct 
and really identified every component of our chemical system. And we're using computer experimental uh, and experimental modeling to study the structure of this entity. And we're also obviously looking at organization, selection, and all other emergent phenomena that are happening in messy chemistries. So let me give you one example of what we're thinking about messy chemistry. And this is a tangible messy chemistry. We like to use polyesters. And the reason we like them is they're sort of uh, resembling peptides. However, they're much easier to synthesize. And it's been uh, said few and few different uh, ways that they could be potential ancestors for peptides. For example, from the work of uh, Alex Rich at MIT, we know that ribosome catalyzes alpha hydroxy acid polyesterification. For non chemists of us, alpha hydroxy acid are OH analogs of alpha amino acid. And especially with lots of work coming from uh, Nick Hud and Ram Krishnamurthy uh, lab, there is a renewed interest in studying polyesters as potential early. Uh, polymers in the origin of life. And so this is, I want to talk about work pioneered at ELSI by Jim Cleves and Kuhan Chandru. So what they did here, it's a very simple experiment. They took five different alpha hydroxy acid, dried them down at um, prebiotically plausible mild conditions. And they're getting this vast complex array of um, components, which is not Surprising, because if you assume you have those f uh, five um, alpha hydroxy acid and assume you only made 20 mers, you will get five to the 20th unique sequences. And obviously, you're not only making 20 mers. And imagine this, how this is a messy system, and this is only at this point based on one reaction, polyesterification. So what Jim and Kuhan right now are doing is trying to figure out ways how they can bias their synthesis to produce um, different polyesters of some somewhat controlled uh, properties, somewhat controlled sequence and structure. So what I'm interested in is whether this messy polymers can be functional. And actually, functionality of messy polymers, even if it wasn't called that, it's not a new idea. So Sidney Fox spent a huge chunk of his career working eff effectively on messy polymers. So what he did. Uh, he dried down like certain mixture of amino acid, and he was able to synthesize those interesting microsphere structures. And he studied them a lot. So, and there's few good things that came out of his research. Some of his papers show that these microspheres are capable of catalysis. Uh, mostly towards hydrolysis, but nevertheless. And then just when, unfortunately, when the good things stop. So the bad, so the opponents uh, always claim that this catalytic activity is always marginal. And Sidney Fox never even tried to explain uh, any mechanism of why, this, why this catalysis is working. And toward the end of his career, unfortunately, the ugly has started. So he claimed that he's making proteins, basically, that the incorporation of amino acids is not random. And there was never evidence to that. That the polymers is forming a linear. And this is particularly funny because it seemed to be uh, working only we ha when he loaded his system with glutamic acid. And you can see there it's bifunctional. So you're probably making some sort of branched uh, polymers. And quite outrageously, he claimed that his microspheres have lifelike uh, behavior or consciousness. And you know what? It just really soured a lot of people. <laughs> just nobody worked on this research for years. So we at ELSI decided to take a different, more structured approach of making a protoenzyme. And what is an enzyme? When you think of an enzyme, it consists of catalytic site, which is scaffolded by intricately folded protein or sometimes RNA uh, polymer. And the function of this scaffold is, um, is important because, well, for once, it protects uh, the uh, active sites from hydrolysis. It helps to bind and orientate very specifically well-needed substrate. And 
Uh, more importantly, it can create um, microenvironments that are different from surrounding water, helping to promote very uh, specific reaction. And in the work pioneered by Daron Breslow, uh, dendrozymes, uh, enzymes uh, that are using this regular branched uh, polymers are widely used, and in some cases they work almost as good as uh, biological enzymes. So what is a dendrozyme? If you see in the middle of that fractal molecule, you have your uh, catalytic site. And then you can uh, just use all sorts of synthetic method to generate uh, generations, sorry, of um, branch polymer surrounding. And you can co control properties like uh, interior of the dendromer solubility. Of course, dendrozymes are very synthetic, uh, very engineered systems which are hardly prebiotic. So we were thinking, what if we took irregular hyperbranched uh, polymer, irregular dendrozymes called hyperbranched polymers. So it turns out these are also uh, globular molecules uh, that are are retaining a lot of um, properties of dendromers, of course, a less control way. And here what we try to do in our first attempt to evaluate the catalytic ability. So that the first question I ask whether um, this hyperbranch polymers is capable of providing modulated environment within the structure that helps promote reactions. So we chose uh, this reaction called Kemp elimination. It's not of any particular uh, interest to prebiotic chemistry, but what is interesting about this reaction, it is very sensitive to a uh, solvent uh, environment. So the reaction proceeds quite sluggishly in water and that the polarity of the solvent is, uh, is dropping, the rate of the reaction is amplified. So what I'm thinking is actually build hyperbranch polymer-based protoenzyme and just force the reaction to happen inside the polymer. Uh, maybe I can actually show that you know, the rate of this reaction is amplified. So what I want an idea then, just in very simple, just simple drying down process, I synthesize this polymer based on citric acid, glycerol, it's a polyester. I threw in a triethanolamine, if I forgot to mention it, Kemp elimination is based catalyzed as well. So triethanolamine in this case serves as a catalytic core. And uh, if you see from that uh, mass spec, you get a very messy polymer. There are a lot of, a lot of different structures. Uh, uh, a lot of different species with different components in them. But what's interesting is they're all rather short, so I'm not getting any species that are higher than 1,000 Daltons. So we're probably uh, talking only seven, seven mers and eight mers. So sounds like short, but I nevertheless uh, went and conducted experiments uh, with the uh, trying to assay this protoenzyme using Kemp elimination. And so I tried few systems. So one of them is citric acid, glycerol, triethanolamine, quite polar. Another one is adipic acid, glycerol, triethanolamine, somewhat less polar, and the same is true for methyl, methyl succinic acid, glycerol, triethanolamine. And if you see like in, the, in that uh, line in red, that is uh, the reaction happening with unpolymerized triethanolamine. And when you try to use citric acid polymer, it works a little bit better. And when you use methyl succinic acid polymers, so reaction proceeds like five times better. And of course, uh, when talking about enzymatic amplification, and just amplification of five sounds like nothing, but just remember, these polymers are messy. These polymers are only seven or eight mer long. This is, I'm just, we're quite excited and we're actually, I'm not ready to talk about it, we're working on scaffolding uh, more uh, biologically relevant active sites, so please stay tuned. And so right now I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about the artificial chemistry effort we're doing in our lab. And this work is pioneered by Nicholas uh, Guttenberg, Nathaniel Verger, and uh, Norman Packard. 
And so first I want to talk about this autocatalysis threshold for dominance. And so in general, what we're trying to achieve here, how do we introduce sparseness into uh, those messy chemistry? Okay, you start with vast array of components. How do you get to clean up the system and produce some sort of order, some sort of function? So uh, Nathaniel there is looking at the system, which is messy which is reversible and it's competing for the same resources. And then he allows uh, for some replicators to form uh, in that particular system. And it turns out, maybe not surprisingly so, that when this replicator reaches a certain threshold rate of autocatalysis, it takes over the whole system. So this is one way to uh, transition to sparseness. And this uh, other system is how do you use a uh, supramolecular interaction uh, to transition to sparseness. And I just kind of want to advertise here a little bit. Uh, Norman Packard will be uh, giving more detailed talk on this um, project on Friday morning. So please come and see him talk. So in this system, they have a solution of you know, messy components and through some introduced supramolecular interaction, they're allowed to precipitate, and you know you can only crash out of solution if you co-precipitating with something else. And in that system, the uh, the solution undergoes like multiple washings, and what you end up here is with here. So in red, you have a system which is completely messy, has a lot of states. But allowing this supramolecular interaction, you eventually transition into this kind of sparser uh, blue system. So, and just when they started talking about that, it just actually brought one of the other hyperbranch polymer system I've been doing when I was in George Cody's lab. And so, in this particular system, we were synthesizing citric acid and glycolyl polymer, and let's just take some learning and just to make hyperbranch polymer rather than um, crosslink ones. You actually need to use excess of one of the ingredients, and so that's what we did. We worked a lot with a system that that uh, consists of two parts glycerol, one part citric acid. And so when you synthesize uh, this polymer by simply dry down, analyze it by mass spec. Uh, what happens, you get a species that are rich in glycerol, which is not surprising. However, when you throw in like basically any divalent cation, your system starts getting rich in species that are actually enriched in um, citric acid. And I think the reason it's happening, it's once again supramolecular interaction. So citric acid is a fantastic chelator for this divalence. And so when citric acid participates in, uh, in chelates, um, it becomes less um, reactive towards polyesterification. And uh, therefore, you know, in order to make polymer, you just need a lot more of it. So I'm hoping at some point, Norm Packard and uh, Nick Guttenberg will actually tweak this previous system to actually help me explain what happens with mine. And this is like the last, completely last um, experiment I want to talk about, and it's pioneered by Nathaniel Virgo in our lab. So here, what he's looking to study, he's studying autocatalysis in this polymerization system. There is one monomer, and in this system, you're, you can now have two monomers react with each other, oligomers can react with each other, oligomers can react with monomers, and then just everything's reversible. And this is a simple system uh, where it's just not completely difficult to figure out what would be the kinetics, what would be the distribution. But then he's doing interesting system for this, uh, for in this um, particular system. So he's disallowing the step of two monomers reacting with each other, or the like, diminishing probability of that happening. And in that case, you see over there, when you're analyzing the kinetic, you have this characteristic lag. You're getting your first order autocatalysis. Well, this reaction it's might be not particularly interesting. It's probably resembling uh, foremost reaction. In foremost, just to bring two formaldehydes together, it's a difficult step, but if once you've done that, the reaction takes off. 
But then Nathaniel went and did things that are completely crazy. He, you know, to say, let's disallow A7 monomer. And what's interesting here, what's starting to happening, you, need to, you start making cycles to access uh, synthetically all of your uh, ligmers in there. And so in this particular uh, sample, he's, he disallowed any um, ligomer that is multiple of threes. And what's happening, he created those interconnected cycles that are quite uh, interesting, quite interconnected. And once again, you have this uh, very um, characteristic lag of autocatalysis. However, the kinetics of this reaction becomes much more complicated. So what's the main point that Nathaniel has to drive over? So in order to get interesting system, interesting autocatalysis, you need to have large, messy, interesting, complicated system. And with that, this is my last slide. I probably you can read my conclusions because I'm over my time. And thank you very much for your attention. I'll take any questions. So we have time for one question over here. Hi, Mike Wong from Caltech. I'm wondering in what planetary environments do you envision this uh, messy chemistry taking place? Where on early Earth is it applicable? Is it applicable to uh, ocean worlds, to Titan? Just your, your thoughts on that. Oh, well, just uh, messy. I, know, I don't know what particular chemistry we're talking about. I think you'll get messy in whatever environment, right? You know, if you don't, you don't have a, your enzymatic reactions, you eventually you'll get some complicated, messy environment. That's how chemistry works. So, so I guess uh, maybe I can rephrase. You, you started mm -hmm. off with a quote by Steve Benner mm -hmm. uh, about adding energy into chemistry, mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then you said, we disagree. So what, what is your uh, energy source in, in, in th that are so, striving these so, directions? So yeah, well, whatever I described here, energy source is just heat from the sun. But from you can sun. think okay. of anything thank else. You. Yeah. All right, let's thank Irina again. And our last speaker this morning is Lee Cronin, um, coming from University of Glasgow. Yeah, yeah, I'm just starting my stopwatch. So, morning, everybody. So, I'm going to kind of change gear a bit and try and think about how you might reimagine life in completely different circumstances to try and see how we might imagine life might occur on, say, Tidon or elsewhere. And to do that, the message I want to kind of start with is thinking, what did life look like before there was life? Well, that's a clearly a crazy question. You just had an environment. But really, the emergence of biology has something to do with taking the environment and putting it into a container. So you have kind of increasing evolution. And this is kind of an interesting idea, because at the beginning, there was no biology. There were no cells. So how do we suddenly shake the environment and out pops some biology? And that's what we're going to try and, and talk about today in the next 10 or 15 minutes. Now, in my group at Glasgow, we are fairly interested in redefining not just the search for biology, but how we might make one. Um, and when we're looking at the origin of life, that's a very interesting question, but it's quite a historical question and quite a hard one. So how can we circumnavigate and get around that problem by imagining a slightly different problem to try and make a life form? To do that, I think we need a new theory for biology and evolution. And I think this is, if we have that, maybe we can use that to develop a model to simulate the emergence of biology. And then if we have a model, then maybe we can use that to build a machine to actually make that biology. And then by doing that, what we've also tried to do in the group is come up with a metric to identify biosignatures. This will not only help find life elsewhere, but if we actually make it in the lab. Wouldn't it be terrible if we make a life form in the lab, we convince you that it's plausible, that it's not a, a robot making a robot, and suddenly we spend 30 years arguing about whether it's really a life form or not? That's kind of, that would be kind of sad. But what I'm going to do today is really focus on this idea of making a machine to emerge new biologies. Now, I'm an inorganic chemist, um, so I would love to blind you with fancy molecules and, and messy chemistry, but the last speaker has done that really elegantly, and I'm going to do something completely different. But let's think about what life is. Is life about chemistry? I don't think so. 
I'm a chemist. I'd love to make everything. I'd like to make myself the center of the universe. And um, I'll let Steve Benner do that. I don't know if he's hiding here. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. Um, but a serious point is, can we, oh, how can we turn blobs into life forms? So let's just think about the blob, the living blob, the blob that survives the environment, the blob that goes through the environment and is able to propagate itself. Is that what life is? Is it as simple as that? Well, I don't want to really start worrying too much, but my group are really interested in taking a morphology first approach. So you can imagine growing things from a seed Okay, well, that's what biology does. Biology got the machinery to do that. But where does the machinery come from? We go round in circles. So could we just allow the environment to generate objects that persist for a long time and can start to copy themselves? And we think that the mechanism given rise to the things are more important than the things themselves. And then look, growing the objects on multiple scales will, will introduce all sorts of ideas when it comes to exploring collective organization. Again. The origin of life problem, or the creation of life problem, is simply how do we take heterogeneity from the environment and put it into a boundary and allow that boundary to be autonomous-ish within that environment. You have that White House with that strange blob in the White House playing with the autonomy. I didn't mention his name. I said I wouldn't. <laughs> but it's a serious question about how the environment compartmentalizes itself. So what we envisaged a few years ago in Glasgow was to try and make an evolutionary engine. And what we wanted to do is start with simple chemistry that almost all of you would, would recognize, like salad dressing, and literally it is salad dressing, and say, can we turn something as simple as salad dressing into an object that morphogenically looks like a life form? So what we envisage is having some kind of mixer, mix up our salad dressing, and then we'd have an entity generator. That could be a piece of rock with a hole in it, and out would come the blobs. The blobs would be put in the arena, and the environment would be changed. We would have a selector. We can play God. Are you going to live? Are you going to die? And then you could then, and the living and the dying part which is really orchestrated here, but you just decide then at the end that you would recycle the ones that you want to live. So now this is very contrived. It's, it's a formulaic system. But you could imagine that the recirculator, if you wanted to observe, a, 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 say, a particular property, see, look, there's no death in our system. We're very elegantarian. So, um, but the point is to generate some entities here, and then to then, by selecting them as a function of the environment, will the objects, as you recycle them, take that environment, that baggage, and use that to create function to become more lifelike? We are all evolutionary baggage. And, and as the first speaker said, you know, in a way, resetting that evolutionary baggage is really interesting because we'll, we'll get more information of mechanism. OK, so what we wanted to do is start with really simple systems, like these oil droplets. These are just oil in water uh, with a stable, series of stabilizers. And yeah, the one on the bottom the left side, I wouldn't really want to be, oops, we'll go back. Getting used to this. I'll reset it. There we go. So if you look at the blue droplets there, I mean, they look kind of lifelike, right? They're, they're chasing this poor geezer and, you know, until he's gone, dead, no longer existing. Whereas this one here, this spiky droplet is moving around, feeling the environment. It looks lifelike, it's kind of mysterious, but it's not, of course. It's just an unstable um, oil and water emulsion, and it loses its form as the, as the stabilizers and the alcohols inside it dissolve in the aqueous phase. So we wanted to take something which I think we all agree is maybe interesting from a physical chemistry point of view, but quite clearly dead. You don't expect your salad dressing to start self-replicating in front of you. So what we wanted to do is build a robot which would basically orchestrate what would happen on a planet Earth, day-night cycle, if you like. So to do this, we've got our solutions, our chemical inputs, some pumps. We then put the pumps um, um, into a robot using some syringes and mixing up the ingredients almost randomly, and then in our Orwellian arena, we will then video what the droplets do. And this is a highly sped up version, because I've only got a few minutes. They could have spent 20 minutes just showing you how this works. But I'll go back again once you've overcome the, the kind of, uh, it's, 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 there's quite a lot in just nine seconds. So I'll play it again. But what you can see is that the formulation is made up here, the salad dressing. 
and then it's prepared and put in this dish and then rotated under in a webcam. And so basically what we can do on the left-hand side at the top is we randomly take some salad dressings, all the different formulations. You could call them the genome if you like. You then take them and put the droplets in the arena and you embody them. It's almost like the genotype to phenotype transition. You take that code and make material and you then evaluate that material with a webcam and then the, ro and then the image recognition makes a decision about life or death. So basically what we've been doing in the, in the lab is using robotic exploration and um, using machine learning and physiochemical analysis to look for interesting morphologies, interesting behaviors. The way we've been doing this is we've used image recognition. Now this is very contrived. Before you get up and say that's not a life form, it's a robot making salad dressing. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> But the point is to see if we can um, show that through selection and uh, propagation, we can do some kind of evolutionary experiment. To do that, we have a workflow where we can take the droplets and do image recognition on the droplets and then decide whether that formulation is a favored formulation. And so we go through the, a very complex workflow, which is, well, it's not that complex, it's relatively simple, but it's quite laborious, and the computer does a lot of the job for us once we've done the initial uh, programming. So the workflow is really, we have this robot controller, handles the chemistry in the robot, the camera does the image tracking, then the pumps are then selected again at random to start with to put in new formulation. So to start with, we just did random stuff. So what, could, what do these droplets do? Well, they move, they diffuse, they divide, they divide at the wall, they explode, which is kind of cool, and they wobble. And rem these are the same four, there's only four or five chemicals in these droplets. Only four or five chemicals, and they're selected at random. We found these um, behaviors by searching the space. So this is like Lazarus, right? You get kind of some kind of reformulation. There's a lot of interesting um, um, physical chemistry here. So, okay, so we've done our random, if you like, messy screen, a bit like we, we could imagine doing in protein space or chemical space. What we then wanted to do is then take those... Um, droplets and see if we could put them through an evolutionary experience. Now, for those of you who want to know what's going on with the droplets, why are they interesting? Where is that motion coming from? Well, the oil droplet has a number of components in them. DEP as a stabilizer, pentanol, octanol, uh, octanoic acid, and there's C-tab outside. And basically, the movement of the alcohol to the aqueous phase gives it all that energy. So you have a metabolism. So that metabolism is really quite important. You have these different behaviors. So what we then did is we took the division part and we put it through an evolutionary algorithm and we embodied the evolution. And basically what we did is we generated a population of dividers and we optimized for population for division. And by the end of 15 generations, we got very good division. We all also did this for motion. And okay, this is arbitrary. This is us adding a fitness function on, but you could imagine um, the Petri dish being the world, and the world selects the droplets from being alive and dead. So what we've been able to do in these experiments is not only randomly make droplets that have really rich behaviors with very similar chemical inputs, um, we've started to evolve them. And this is really quite important, because if you imagine going to Titan, Titan has got really simple organic chemistry. Has it not the type of chemistry we would normally imagine would be associated with life? But I reckon that the, you can probably make lifelike things in oils, okay, and get evolutionary behavior to emerge. Now, in the last five minutes of the talk, I'm going to try and convince you of this a bit more dramatically. So in this system, we were quite excited when we did this because this is the first time that evolutionary genetic algorithms have been embodied in an interacting population. So we actually have a genome, we have fitness landscapes, and it looks like biology, you get epistasis, pedotropy. All these things you associate with biological evolution, we were getting in salad dressing. How could this be? And, on the, and you can see here, the, as a function of generation, the fitness of, of function, the, um, the number of droplets um, for the offspring goes up, the, the ability to move goes up, and the vibration goes up. And we show the different uh, error limits there. So what we wanted to do now is say, okay, 
We have shown that we can use a genetic algorithm to put droplets into a glass dish and optimize them. That's like, if you are really the worst critic, that's what you'd say. So what? You've optimized salad dressing. I already know how to make salad dressing. So <laughs> what I want us to then try and do is to say, well, can we then show how changes in the environment show the evolutionary trajectory changes? So we had to make a new robot, and we call this Flowbot. So again, pumps for chemical inputs, and we now 3D print a microfluidic device and a chamber. And because we're 3D printing the chamber, Guess what we can do? We are God of the world because we can rechange the, the digital landscape. We just change the code. And that's what we did. Um, so to start with, before we did that, we just demonstrated we could again evolve um, division because a division is probably a good, good measure for um, making protocells, which we're now going to call them, not salad dressing, to make uh, life forms. So you can see down the bottom here the number of um, uh, the population going up. And this is how the, uh, the droplets look in our 3D printed Petri dish in the empty arena. So this is the empty world. This is the easy world of the droplet. And you can see some of the droplets are changing color because the pH is changing over time. So what we then did is say, right, we are now going to 3D print environments. Here are the caves. And we used uh, a, a really simple procedures to generate algorithmically different environments. And the idea is now to say, let's take random stuff and change the environment and see how the environment, if you like, digitally changes the, um, the outcome. So do we go from the genotype to the phenotype via an envirotype? Now, if you don't like those words, it's fine. Just say, can we change the starting conditions um, by changing, getting the environment to help us out? So we then started to say, OK, if we 3D printed pillars, how would that change the division of the droplets? And you can see as a function of generation, we've got all sorts of interesting behaviors. You did get division. Uh, you were able to optimize after a drop-off. This is what the droplets look like in the, in the pillared arena. In fact, the pillars, in some cases, assist division. Here's some examples of how the droplets all play. And what we didn't, understand, what we didn't anticipate is actually the surfactant coats the plastic pillars and makes them slippery at some point. And then the droplets get released. Now, this is an e now an ecosystem. The, the actual entities, the artificial living entities, are now affecting the dead environment and, and changing it to suit its evolutionary trajectory. Now, this I'm over time now, as now. <laughs> um, but I've only got a couple of slides left. So what, what point am I trying to make? Well, now we've done environmentally coupled evolution. I'll take you back to the beginning where we were doing evolution in an empty Petri dish. We then put some features into the Petri dish. And as you can see on the left-hand side, you've got the empty dish. Then you've got the different pillared arrays and the caves. And you could see, if you look up at the graph, how we have um, um, the change of the, um, the, the number of droplets in the arena. You can see goes up as it's being optimized all the way there. So we got evolution, so we can increase the population. Then when you go from the empty arena to the pillars, it filters the population, and it drops off dramatically, and the evolution starts again. And when you go to the caves, it continues. The really interesting thing is the, is, the, is the life form, if you like, the best formulation from the caves survives in the empty arena, but the formulation for the empty arena doesn't survive in the caves. And it's shown in this fit fitness map down here, where this a species starts to decrease over time. And what you get here on the fitness landscape is a new peak, which, we, which uh, if you were a geneticist looking at, popula looking at populations of objects that are living, you'd call that a new species. And, and, and so what we show here is we took the heat, we basically took the formulation and generated a heat map and made a letter code, a kind of genome. And you can see how from the, the best genome for the empty arena um, to the pillar arena, to the caves, to the best one of the caves, you can see how we get this G to E to F mutation. The A's are kept, but C mutates to E, B mutates to B, and you can see from this species to this species, or this, this generation, this arena to this arena, the mutation, and this arena to this arena. So what does this all mean? Well, it means that in a robotic environment, if you use the robot as a, almost like the custodian, um, that you can start to do evolution in very simple systems, and they interact with the environment, and the environment influences the trajectory of the optimization or the evolution. So this means that evolution can work outside of biology, 
So the next step for us is really to put in messy chemistry and get these oil droplets to select the chemistry to actually start to behave. So I'm going to stop here and thank my research group. I've done all this work, particularly the robots team. And I have to because I think I have two young boys at home in Glasgow watching this say hello to them. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Hi, yeah, I'm Lauren from uh, Georgia Tech, and I, I want to talk about uh, messy chemistry a little bit because I was really struck by that because what we've been thinking about the ribosome, which we believe is the oldest existing enzyme in biology, is that it's a terrifically nonspecific uh, catalytic center which looks to be designed for messy chemistry. You can, it's kind of a nonspecific condensation machine. And um, so I was thinking that basically there's a lot of broad support for your idea I have kind of a sociological question, I guess, really. If you look back at Gilbert's seminal paper mm -hmm. on the RNA world, it describes this kind of pure, simple RNA world that had some kind of ability to capture people's imagination. And I think it just set us all in the wrong direction. Um, it was sort of the opposite of messy chemistry. And I think it, it kind of set the field back a little bit by directing us sort of towards pure pure chemistry. Thank you for the comment. You guys have anything to say to that? <laughs> I mean, I have a comment to make on the messy chemistry. The, I think the, the second speaker put it absolutely correctly that, um, that people have been avoiding messy chemistry, and, but messy chemistry is the only way forward. It might be dilute, it might not be very interesting to start with, but the transition, and my group and the ELSI group are you know, talking about and working on this type of process to basically, what is the messiest mixture that can give us genuine complexity? Now, I use those two words deliberately, and that's an outstanding question that I think a lot of us want to answer, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm Charlie Lineweaver from the Australian National University. It's a question for Lee. At the end of your talk, you, you said something about what you plan on doing, and I was wondering if it... As I was watching your blobs move around, I thought, wouldn't it be nice if those blobs could control the amount of chemicals and the free energy that they have access to? Absolutely. And Absolutely. Is that what you plan on doing? Is so I'll, tell, I'll give you a snippet. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to make mazes as like, with them, you can imagine the assault, the, the environment for me is like a ass military assault course that not everyone gets out of, right? So the droplets go down the assault course, and only the, only the ones that get to the end get fed. On, and in the end, they can select from different pit stops, different types of fuels, to then develop strategies to go to the next maze. And what we're going to see is if we can get droplets that in the end become autonomous and can start to replicate. Um, we've just had a paper accepted, I think I can say, where we've got a replicating um, chemical reaction that replicates droplets on the macro scale. So if we could get those droplets to go and feed off the replicant, fuel, they can then overtake the droplet universe, if you know what I mean. Right, That's so a the great feed, question. Yeah, so feedback put in. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Next question. Yeah, so one of the reoccurring themes that I noticed throughout all the talks is um, you all seem to have identified specific biases in the way we think about the origin of life. So with messy chemistry, the bias that you sort of addressed was that chemistry should be specific and it should be one reaction. And uh, with evolution, you said there's all this evolutionary baggage that sort of top-down approaches come with, and you've been identifying ways to get rid of that and study hypotheses directly. And Lee, you sort of got around the bias of what to select for by selecting for lots of things. Uh, do you think there's any other biases in the way we think about the process of the original life or the experiments that we do that we haven't really identified or that are not, we're not keenly aware of in the field yet? So questioners should say their name, too. Oh, I'm Cole Matt. That's from ASU. Um, I would say that, that so there's bias everywhere, but I think that w but that bias isn't necessarily bad. Bias helps us come up with a hypothesis and then destroy it. What I find what I find exciting about the origin of life, let me call it exciting rather than depressing, is that that bias um, does go into hypotheses, but the time scale for that has been slow and it's now speeding up. So I'm really excited by that. So I think to answer your question more directly, I think there's a really interesting bias, the kind of what life is. I think life is a continuum of process. And so in my lab, what we're trying to do is make a metric and then work with you guys and wh whoever else wants to get on board is to look for a metric that basically life tends to make complicated stuff. So if we can just look for complicated stuff in the universe and also try and make as complicated a problem as we can in our lab without actually coding it, look at the emergence of complexity, that might be a way of removing a lot of bias because we just go for complex stuff first rather than worrying about the precise kind of archaeology for pre-Luca because it's hard. 
I, I would say that for, for biology, um, I think the, the, the view of uh, biology as a complex system can also be challenged. And perhaps we can also strip biology into systems that are uh, not as complex, and maybe uh, these systems are embedded within the biology that we know today. And what I mean is that, that we have a layer of complexity that we need to deal with, but perhaps by creating simpler systems, and I gave the example of uh, protocells here, and, or maybe making an artificial organism ourselves, we can reach to a degree of biology that is more controllable. For example, in, in, in at least in laboratory evolution experiments, and again, these are building on the, the organisms that are complex and that are adapted to, to life today, uh, we do realize that and what, what we, we see is that initial mutations do determine the, the, the trajectory of the evolution, uh, evolutionary trajectory that is going to be taken by the organism. And if, if this can apply to, to, to life itself and the early life itself, and if the initial mutations that determine the complexity of biology, I think uh, we could challenge biologists also to, to reach to that very step and then think about a biology that maybe is not as complex as we think it is. Great. Um, so we are officially out of time. So I want to thank all three of our speakers again for excellent talks and really challenging our conceptions about origins.